you love us as you find us. That is just who you are. There's nothing that we could ever do to earn that love. We thank you for this time of worship. Prepare our hearts, Lord. Prepare our minds to take in your truth, to take in your word. And carry it with us wherever we go. We thank you, Father. All for you in your son's precious name. Amen, church. Amen. Hey everyone, welcome to Centerpoint Online Campus. My name is Brett and I have the privilege of being the online campus pastor and I'm so glad that you are with us right now wherever you are watching this from. Just wanna give a shout out to everyone who's watching in Florida and the Carolinas, down in Virginia. Thanks so much for being here and especially to those of you who are our guests for the first time, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. We're honored to have you as our guest. Take a few moments, do me a favor, and fill out that online Connect card. Fill that card out with as much info as you feel comfortable sharing with us, just so that we know that you are here with us, and it also helps us to better serve you. If there's something that you need prayer for, or if you have any questions about Centerpoint, or about taking your next steps in your walk with God, I'm here for you, and I'd love to connect with you and answer any questions that you might have. So take a few moments and fill out that Connect card uh, when you have the chance. So we are now dead center in the middle of August, which means we are halfway through our All In August challenge. This of course is our challenge to all of you to not miss a single Sunday service in the month of August, whether by attending in person, online, or on demand. And it's been so encouraging to see how locked in everybody has been during this month so far uh, so many of you have responded, hashtag challenge accepted. You've posted photos of your progress and it's just been great. And we're halfway to the finish line at this point. So I really encourage you, don't think, oh, well, I missed the first week or I missed the second week. I may as well punt it. Let's not have that attitude. It's not too late to get in, go all in on this challenge. Again, don't miss a single service. Either attend online, in person or on demand and let us know you're all in with us by using the hashtag all in August on all your social media platforms. Speaking of going all in, have you ever left the house to go on a run or a walk or any kind of workout and to really go all in on that? And then suddenly you have this feeling that you've forgotten something and you can't quite put your finger on it until with the terror you realize what it was. You didn't have your Fitbit on or you didn't turn on the workout app on your watch and you're not logging any of these steps. All of those movement stats are gone. None of your, none of your rings are going to be closed. It, it's a horrible feeling. It's like if you don't have the proof on your app, did it even count? Did anything ever happen? And I think for many of us, we use that same lens when it comes to giving. When we give to the Lord, we give with a heart of worship and a heart of gratitude for all the things that he's gifted us with. But it can be discouraging sometimes to look at the world, look at the state of things and wonder, what good does my giving actually do? What does it accomplish? But the kingdom of God is not something that can be measured in the same way that we measure the, our Fitbit stats. It's not the same thing. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 13 about the kingdom of God. He taught his disciples that the kingdom of God is like the smallest seed that grows slowly, imperceptibly under the earth until it grows into the largest tree in the field and it offers fruit and life and shade to the world around it. And you don't have to look any further than me for proof that that's true. When I was 15 years old, I attended a youth conference in Syracuse, New York. And someone in the church had donated uh, money, given a gift to cover the registration costs for anyone who didn't have the money. I went to this conference and my life was changed. I, for the first time, heard the gospel and understood the gospel and the love of God uh, for me. And I came to faith in Jesus. Now, whoever gave that money, I don't know that they ever heard what happened or understood the effect that that gift had on my life. 
But although they couldn't quantify it in the short term and they couldn't see the value immediately, I stand today before you as living proof of the value that that gift had in my life and for the kingdom of God. Maybe your giving and your gift will have the same effect in the life of a teenager at Centerpoint. Or maybe it goes to uh, CP Kids or VBS and plants a, a seed of God's love and biblical truth in the heart of one of our children. But whatever it does, we can't count out the value that our gifts have uh, in the kingdom of God. I wanna thank you all so much for continuing to give online, uh, whether you're giving at cpchurch.com give or whether through the app, um, you guys have been so generous and so faithful. Um, but I wanna encourage you, let's not grow weary in doing good uh, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for um, all the gifts that you've given us, Lord. You are our creator, um, and everything we give is just a small token of gratitude and, and saying thanks for what you've done for us. So I pray that you take these gifts, take our hearts, uh, take our lives, and let it all go to the glory of your great name and to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Paul's letter to the Philippians. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Walk with us through the book of Philippians, which Paul wrote as a guide to ordinary living with extraordinary love. Together, we will discover that faith is more than a feeling. Faith is where we can be found. Faith is where we are alive. Hello, Centerpoint Church. I want to thank you for joining me today at our online campus. My name is Chris Kroger. I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here at Centerpoint Church. And I also have the honor today of bringing you the message, week six of our series that we're in right now called Alive. And what we're doing in this series is we are going chapter by chapter, line by line through the book of Philippians. And we're trying to pull out of this book what it is that God really wants to teach us about being fully alive in Christ. And so the book of Philippians is actually a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in a city called Philippi. That's where we get the name Philippians. And today we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. But before we jump into these scriptures, I want to look at the very first word of verse 12, where Paul says, therefore, before he goes into saying anything else. And I was always taught that when we see this word in scripture, therefore, we're supposed to stop and ask ourselves, what is it therefore? This therefore in verse 12 is really referring to what Pastor John and what the Apostle Paul was teaching us last week. And I think it ties really specifically in to the last two verses of our teaching from last week in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Paul says this. He says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Paul begins in verse 12 by saying, therefore, because of who Jesus is, because of what's to come, he says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you, will be, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and I rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Throughout the book of Philippians, Paul is teaching us principles um, that I, I believe are kind of like what I call contentment and peace transplants in our lives. 
Paul, throughout the book of Philippians, teaches us that by taking peace and contentment out of the realm of our circumstances, we can actually find peace and contentment in things that can never be taken or stolen from us. Now, last week, we walked through Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, and Paul taught us about the importance of humility. He taught us that Jesus was a humble servant, and we are to emulate that same character and those same things in our life. Now, today I want to continue to talk about humility, but I want to talk about humility in a way today that is much different than I think we talked about last week. Today, I want to talk about the power of humility. When I say the words power and humility together in the same sentence, for some of you, that may sound like an oxymoron, right? Like when you're at a restaurant and you order jumbo shrimp, right? It's just like it doesn't go together. And I believe in our culture, we tend to think that humble people are powerless people. In a sense, humble people are are invisible people. They're meek, they're timid. That's how we tend to view people that are humble. But that's not how it really is. Just because people don't want to be in the spotlight doesn't mean that they are powerless. Let me give you an example from the business world, and we don't even have to go to the scriptures. I read a book a long time ago. Maybe you've read it. It's titled Good to Great. And in this book, the premise behind this book is that a team of researchers studied a bunch of Fortune 500 companies. And these researchers analyzed the success of these companies and the leadership of these companies. These researchers were looking for for a couple standout companies that were just average companies. They were rolling along, everything was going well, they were making some money, but then suddenly they went from good companies to great companies. And these researchers, they only studied companies that stayed at the great level for 15 years or longer. So it couldn't be just a company that had created a product and was a, a flash in the pan. It had to be a company that sustained that greatness for a period of time. And what was learned about these companies is that what made them different, what took them from good to great, it was a number of things. But the most interesting thing to me was they found that all of these good to great companies that they studied, they had a certain kind of leader. The book calls them level five leaders. And the the researchers described what a level five leader was. And there was one word that kept coming up over and over again regarding these, these level five leaders. And I was surprised to find out it was the word humble. These researchers found that the leaders of these standout companies, for the most part, were humble leaders. They they were found to be leaders who, who didn't insist on attention or look for attention or accolades. These leaders took all the influence and power that they had, and they were humble, and they turned it towards their companies and their employees to make them better. And this comes to my point of believing that humility and power are not in conflict with each other. People can be humble and still have a tremendously powerful influence. Jesus was one of these people. Humility and power are not enemies of one another. And yet we still, most people, when I talk to them, they they think that humble people are meek and mild and even invisible people. But that's not the case at all. I've come to believe that the reason the Bible talks so much about humility is because that God knows that Christ-like humility actually makes us more powerful in a good way as Christians. What if humility is actually the key to greater influence for Jesus in our Christian lives and in the world? What if we have it backwards? What if humility doesn't reduce or influence our our influence or make us invisible? What if humility, now Christ-like humility is what I'm talking about, what if it increases our influence in the world for Christ? What if humility is the greater thing that we need to influence the world for Jesus? and we don't have to be powerless and and a doormat. I wanna give you three practical action steps today that I believe Paul is instructing us to take in our lives so that we can make a greater impact for Jesus in this world. Now understand, these, these action steps aren't something that I came up with that are slick ideas. These come right from the scriptures that Paul is teaching us today. The first action step is this. We need to put God's agenda first. Look again at Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Paul says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now remember, Paul is in jail in Rome. He's in chains. He's far away from the Philippians. 
But he's not only speaking to the Philippians. He's also speaking to us through this letter. And this is what Paul says I want you to do. He's saying, Center Point Church, I want you to continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now that phrase, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, has been confusing people for years because we've misunderstood what that means. What Paul is really saying here is he's saying, live out your salvation. You've been saved. You are in Christ. You have access to God now. Live out your salvation boldly. Paul's not telling us we need to work for our salvation or to earn it. We can't do that anyway. Salvation is a free gift of God. And then Paul says in in the second part of verse 12, that word again, fear and trembling. Now we might think when we read that word, we might be thinking that we are to live our lives in terror of God, that if any moment we mess up, he he might come and punish us. But Paul is using that phrase, fear and trembling, kind of like a Bible slang word. And what he really means is we need to live in awe of God, in awe of what God has done for us. And then look at what Paul says going on into verse 13. He says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. What Paul says here is that we should live out our salvation in awe And the awe should come from the fact that God is working in us. In other words, our awe of God should motivate us. It should spur us on. It should energize us to live out the truth of our salvation in a bold way. Paul says we should be in awe that God is working in and through us. And really that makes sense, right? If we truly understand who God is. I mean, this is the God who flung 100 billion galaxies into place. This is the God who put 100 billion stars in each of these galaxies across the expanse of heaven. These heavens that are so vast, none of us can begin to wrap our heads around even the outside edge of it. That is the God that we're talking about. Paul says that God is working in us to help fulfill his purposes. That God is the one who sent his one and only son to die for us so we could be made right before God. That's the God that's working in us and will act in us. I don't know about you, but that's an incredible truth. That's huge. God is transforming us from the inside out. And then he empowers us to act so that we can accomplish his purposes in the world. Paul is telling us today that we are supposed to will and to act and to accomplish and fulfill God's purposes in the world. Again, think of who that God is. He's the God who spoke creation into existence. He's the God who flung the stars into the heavens. This all-powerful God, this all-loving God, he looks at this little speck called planet Earth, and he says, I have a work I want to do there. And the way that I'm going to accomplish it is I'm going to use you. God is going to use us, if we allow him to, to accomplish his will on Earth. Maybe I'm just the only one that gets super psyched about that, but that is awesome that that God would want to be part of our lives? Why would God choose for us to be part of his work in the world? Because honestly, he could do it better himself. He's God. Well, the answer is ultimately because he so loves us and he enjoys allowing us to partner with him in his work in the world. And that is why Paul says, live out your salvation in awe. Live out your salvation with awe that God is working in you and through you. That should motivate us as Christians. And when Paul speaks of terror, he's not saying that we should live in this terror that God's going to punish us at any moment. Think about this. Think about this. God is allowing Center Point Church right now to be on mission with him in this world. And that's pretty good news. That's awesome news, right? We get to be part of the work that God's doing. We get to be on mission with Jesus. But whenever there's good news, there's also bad news, right? Whenever there's good news, we always know bad news is coming. The good news is is that God is amazing and he's at work. But here's the bad news. And I believe it's the second action step that I believe Paul is instructing us to take in our lives so we can make a greater impact for Christ. We need to check our agendas. We need to check if the agendas that we have in our life line up with God's agenda. See, to cooperate with everything that God is doing, we have to check our agendas, our motives. 
And I hate to tell you all of this, but it, when we do this, we are going to have to give something up that some of us really love to do. Paul talks about in Philippians 2.14 when he says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Sounds simple enough, right? Just cooperate with God and don't argue and complain. Let's be honest, though, with each other. And if you're not willing to be honest, I'll break the ice and I'll be honest. Grumbling and arguing is one of the things that I love to do at certain times in my life. When things are not going the way that I want them to go, when people aren't doing what I want them to do, I love to play the martyr and be like, okay, well, I'll go along with all this. I'll work with that person. But I want everyone to know I'm not really happy about it. How many of us, if we're really honest with each other, we find some comfort and pleasure in being able to grumble and argue when we don't like how things are going or how certain people are, are acting. But we have to give that up, God says. God is going to do an awesome work in us and through us. He's going to let us be part of his amazing work that he is doing in the world. But we have to be willing to give up grumbling and arguing. Here's the thing that we have to come to believe to overcome that desire to, to grumble and argue. We have to believe that God's agenda is better than ours. See, the reason we grumble and argue is because we want our agenda. We want things our way. But Paul says to us today, do everything without grumbling and arguing. So how do we do that? And to be honest, I had to ask the Lord that this week as I was preparing. Lord, how do I stop grumbling and arguing? And I felt like what the Lord spoke to my heart is, is simply that I need to focus on what he has done rather than what he hasn't done yet. And I spent time this week just kind of going over in my head just all the things that God has done in my life up to this point. And what I realized is so often I stop looking at what he's done and I start looking at what he hasn't done yet that I want coming up in the future. We need to pay attention to what God has done more than we pay attention to what he hasn't done yet. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking God for something, but it should be born out of a heart that is filled with trust. Trust that God has acted on our behalf time and time and time again. He takes care of us. He can be trusted. He's not absent. He's not aloof. He's not absent-minded. He's a good, good father. Paul is telling us today to live out our salvation in awe that God is at work in changing us from the inside out and that we get to be part of helping him accomplish what he is seeking to do in the world. But we have to cooperate with God in every situation we find ourselves. We need to seek to do whatever God is calling us to do and we need to do it without grumbling and arguing. I lived this out a couple years ago. Actually, on, on the 12th of this month was my two-year anniversary of coming to Long Island, New York to be the campus pastor at Center Point Church, Long Beach. But I gotta tell you, before I came here, I was living in San Diego, and I was pastoring, and I was finishing up a ministry assignment there, and I started to look for a new place to go and serve, and I came across this really awesome ad for a pastor in Long Beach, and it went on about how wonderful the people were, and it was a beach community, and it was casual, and I was reading this, I'm like, that's it, that's the job for me. And so I started gathering my resume together and some video samples to send to apply for this job, and then I realized it was Long Beach, New York, not Long Beach, California. And instantly in my head, I went, oh, no, yeah, I guess that's not the job for me. And I, I even went to my wife, and she's like, my wife Amy's like, no, we are not moving to New York. And we had this whole list of reasons and, and things that we thought were so bad about New York. But God started to speak to my heart, and he's like, but I didn't tell you that you weren't going to New York. I ended up sending my stuff in. It wasn't long after that that Pastor Brian got a hold of me. We talked, and, and reluctantly on a lot of levels, we went for an interview, and we came to Long Beach. And I did fall in love with the people really quick. And I was thinking about that this week. What if I had put my agenda before God's? What if, what if I had said, no way, because I don't like it's going to be cold. I don't like that it's going to be crowded. I don't like that it's going to be expensive. And if I put my agenda in front of God's, I would have never come to be the campus pastor in Long Beach. And I truly believe I would have missed out on one of the greatest things God's done in my life. We got to put God's agenda before ours, and we got to check our agendas Paul goes on to say in Philippians 2, 15, he says, so that you may become blameless and pure, 
children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. We see here that there's a lot at stake, but we can also see the finish line. We see what is going to happen if we put God's agenda first and stop worrying about our agenda. If we stop grumbling and arguing, God's going to be able to use us in a deeper way. According to Paul, if we do this, we are going to be transformed and we are going to become blameless and pure children of God. And we will stand out in a crooked and warped generation. Paul says we will become blameless and pure. Now, if you're anything like me, when I hear Paul say you're going to become blameless and pure, I think he's referring to us being without sin, right? Meaning that, that I'm not caught up in, in sin, I'm not you know, envying and gossiping and, and that I'm jealous and that I'm caught up in some chronic sin. And notice how Paul says we are going to become blameless and pure when we stop grumbling and arguing. So how does not grumbling and not arguing make us blameless and pure? The answer is it doesn't. Paul's not talking here about sin like we typically think of sin. Paul's talking here about cooperation with God's agenda. Paul's talking here about our ability to cooperate with God and what God's doing in the world and aligning ourselves with God's agenda. Paul's saying when we are grumbling and arguing, we cannot cooperate with what God's doing. We're not following God's agenda, and therefore, really, we're not blameless and pure. And for me, this is such an intimidating thought. I don't know if it is for you, but it's really easy for me to get fixated on whether or not I'm living a blameless and pure life. So often I think, well, you know, I'm not caught up in this sin and this sin and this sin. I'm not stuck in any chronic sinful behaviors. And so I'm able to check all the boxes indicating that I feel like I'm living a blameless and pure life. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't hear what I'm not saying. God speaks a lot about being blameless and pure. But that is not what Paul is talking about here. What Paul is talking about here is our ability to put God's agenda above our own before our own agenda. That is what it means to be blameless and pure in the context of what Paul is teaching us today. See, blameless and pure people, they put God's agenda first. And that is why they don't grumble and argue because when they're in situations that they're not happy that they're in, that they weren't expecting, they just go, you know what, I'm okay. God's got this. I just need to figure out what God wants me to do in whatever situation he has me in. Paul is telling us here what it means in this context to be blameless and pure. And this is such a hard truth because it means that we can have all kinds of personal purity. But if we're not pursuing God's agenda above our own, we're actually missing the mark with God. And I find, you know, with people in the church in my own personal life that I'm always checking off the boxes to make sure that I'm living a pure life. But am I cooperating with God's agenda? If I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not often pursuing my God's agenda. I'm pursuing my agenda. And I mask it under the fact that I'm a pastor and I can make it all look really wonderful, but there's a lot of things that I'm pursuing that are not God's agenda, and he's really convicted me of this. As we have studied this book, I find that I spend a lot of time pursuing my wants, my plans, my desires. And my plans are not necessarily sinful. My agenda is not necessarily sinful, but it's not God's agenda sometimes. And what Paul is telling us here is that God is just as concerned about our personal agenda as much as he's concerned about our personal purity. And I think this is a side of following Jesus that we often miss and we don't even think about. We often think as Christians that to become like Jesus, we just need to get all the sin out of our life, right? Stop doing this, 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 and this. But equally as important is following God's agenda in our personal lives and extending his influence into the world. Paul is telling us today that if we are, are not looking at both sides of this equation, we're not nearly as blameless and pure and shining as we think we are. See, God is concerned about our personal agenda as much as he is concerned about our personal purity. And Paul says, there's a lot riding on this. He goes on in verse 16 of Philippians 2, and Paul says, as you hold firmly to the word of life, 
And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Now, the word of life that Paul is speaking about here is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when Paul's talking about holding firmly to the gospel here, he's not meaning holding tight to it and using it like a shield to block us from all the bad things in the world. He's saying hold it tight, more like a banner that we are to carry out with us into the world. We are to carry the word of life, the gospel of Jesus, into the world. And we're to carry it like a light into darkness in our world. And I think this is the third action step Paul is instructing us to do in our lives based on what he's saying in these scriptures today. The third action step is we need to advance into dark places and we need to shine. When Paul talks about shining like stars in the sky, he was probably quoting from the Old Testament book Daniel, where in Daniel chapter 12, verse 3, it says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. What do stars do? They're more than just sparkling things that are pretty in the sky. One of the things that stars do and have done throughout history is they have led people. Even in the ancient world, if you were trying to get to a faraway place, you would find a star and you would focus on that star. You would put the bow of your your ship on that star. And night after night, it would lead you to eventually where you were trying to go. And Paul is saying here, those who lead many to righteousness, those who lead many to a relationship with God through faith in Jesus, they shine like stars in the heavens. So I started my message today asking this question about humility. Is it possible that humility is actually the key to power and greater influence for Jesus? And I believe it most certainly is. Here's the power of humility. Humility isn't about not ever being noticed. Humility is not about about not needing to be noticed. Humility is about being able to take any attention that is put on you and turn it back and put it on Jesus. Humility doesn't say, I'm never noticed. It says, I never need to be noticed. And if I am noticed, I'm going to take that attention and I'm going to give Jesus all of the credit. I'm going to put it back on him. And that, according to Paul, will make us shine like stars in a warped and crooked world. See, humility gives us the power to shine and to lead people out of darkness. And when we live this way, Paul says in the second part of Philippians 2.16, then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Paul is saying something really cool. If you can picture this here, he's going to stand before Jesus one day. And he's hoping that his teachings and his labor was not in vain. And it won't be if his teachings and labor changed his listeners into living more like Jesus. Think of the amount of people who are living more like Jesus because of the labor and teaching that Paul did. And then Paul closes with verses 17 and 18 of Philippians 2. He says, but even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Listen, Paul wanted to go to Rome and be a preacher and an evangelist. But he ends up being a prisoner who is a preacher and an evangelist. I have to believe that being in prison was not on Paul's agenda. But the bottom line is when we give our life to Christ, it's not about our agenda anymore. We no longer have an agenda. Our agenda agenda becomes Christ's agenda. And God's agenda needs to go first. And even though we might suffer, Paul says, I am glad and rejoice with all of you so that you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's not miss this. We can only truly do that. We can only truly rejoice if God's agenda is what is being played out. I think this is the secret to contentment and peace that can only come from having humility like that of Christ. When God's agenda is first in our lives, circumstances that feel like obstacles actually become opportunities, either for God to work in us and transform us, or for us to be light in darkness and to lead people out of darkness. So that the action call today, based on Paul's teaching, is we need to put God's agenda first. How are we doing with that? And then we need to check our agenda. We need to regularly check our agenda to see if it lines up with God's. And then we need to advance into dark places and shine. 
See, the power of humility gives us the power to shine and to lead people out of darkness. And I don't have to tell you that there are a lot of dark places in our world right now that need the light of Christ. And if only we will have the humility to put God's agenda above ours, will we be able to make a difference in this warped and corrupt generation. Jesus is calling us to join him on mission to do his work in this world. And we need to decide, will we do it? Will we buy in? We will, 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 will we get behind it? So I want to pray, and, and I just want to ask the Lord to speak to your hearts about what you need to do. What is he calling you to? What things do you need to adjust in your life to align with God's agenda? Will you pray with me? Lord, I thank you that you give us these instructions, Lord, in your word. Lord, when I look at your, your word, I, I, I think everything I read is opposite of what the world is doing to really be alive. So Lord, I pray right now, Lord, that we would take time and we would check our agenda, Lord. And if our agenda isn't lined up with your agenda, Lord, that we would push our agenda aside and we would embrace your agenda. And Lord, that you would use us to take the light of your gospel into the dark places of the world, wherever you call us to go, Lord. And Lord, if there's anyone listening here today that has never allowed your agenda to become their agenda, Lord, I pray that today they would, they would simply cry out to you and invite you to be their Lord and Savior, Lord, and that you would begin that work in them. Lord, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you invite us in to the work that you are doing. Thank you that you love us, that you forgive us. Lord, I pray that we would be a people that live out your agenda here on earth and that you would empower us through your Holy Spirit to do so. Lord, I pray all of these things in your mighty name, Jesus. Amen.
thank you for this time of worship. We thank you that you're for us, that you're with us, beside us, that you go before us. Lord, we thank you so much. We always have us wrapped. says in Psalm 37, even though we may stumble, we will not fall because you uphold us in your hand. We give you praise and thanks, Jesus. All his people said amen. Amen, church. I'm so glad that you can join us, Centerpoint Online Campus. As we continue our All in August challenge, don't forget to fill out that digital connect card so we can connect with you and have this two-way conversation with you and I. We can pray with you. It'd be awesome to get to know you guys on a better level. But um, don't forget to tune in next week as we continue this All in August, as we continue our summer series. God bless. Take care, guys. <laughs>